Dear friends and colleagues in global health, my name is Jeanette Magnus, and I'm the director of the Center for Global Health at the University of Oslo. Welcome to this webinar where we'll celebrate the new gender and glo in global health cross-cutting theme at the center. The Center for Global Health is an initiative of the Faculty of Medicine here in Oslo as part of the 2030 Agenda to meet the Sustainable Development Goals. And we know SDG 5 focuses on gender equality and empowerment of women and girls, but it is also imperative to all the SDGs. On behalf of the Center for Global Health, I'm excited to bring uh, to you this seminar today, and Professor Kari Nyheim Solbrekke will be our moderator. Professor Kari is trained in sociology and gender studies with a long standing experience in interdisciplinary health sciences and education, with a special focus on equitable distribution of power, privileges, and priorities related to gender and health. Uh, Professor Solbrekke has had several positions of trust related to the field of gender study, studies, such as head of the board of the Center for Gender Research here at the University of Oslo, as president of the Norwegian Association for Gender Research, and is on the advisory group of the Norwegian chapter of Women in Global Health. Following her strong engagement in gender and health, She's currently involved in a global capacity building program in Africa and Ethiopia as PhD supervisor, as well as instructing academic staff in how to enhance a gender focus in science and education. Please, Kari, Professor Kari, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeanette, and a warm welcome from my side as well to everyone attending this event. I am both happy and proud that we are gathered here today to celebrate that the Center for Global Health had decided to make gender in global health as a new cross-cutting theme. I would also like to highlight that this event is co-hosted by Women in Global Health Norway. Women in Global Health Norway is the national chapter of Women in Global Health, an organization built on global movement with the largest <clears throat> sorry, network of women and allies working to challenge power and privilege for gender equity in health. Started in 2015, the movement has grown to include over 50,000 supporters in 1990 countries and has 24 official chapters with a strong presence in low and middle income countries. In today's event, we have decided to set the scene regarding gender and global health rather broadly, and at the same time focusing on women by asking in what ways can increased community engagement provide a pathway to women's independence and better health? And how and why should academic institutions like the University of Oslo contribute to the enhancement of gender in research and education? that leads to healthy lives for all. More specifically, and indeed inspired by the 2020 winner of the University of Oslo's Human Rights Award, Marcelina Butsa, of which you will meet very soon, we will highlight ways local community efforts can strengthen women's possibility and capacities for financial independence, break violence against women's rights, reduce hazards related to childbirth, and advanced communities to include good health for all. And to contribute to this discussion, we are delighted to have an outstanding expert panel of speakers, and I will uh, present them more in depth, of course, later. Before that, I would also like to po point out that a decision on implementing gender as a cross-cutting theme in an academic setting is not a decision that comes by itself. As this event will demonstrate, quite a few actors and organizations at different levels and in different regions has for a long time worked on gender framed as a global issue. Consequently, to establish gender as a cross-cutting team at the center, stand out as a very timely acknowledgement of an increasing and of course, 
during the pandemic as shared awareness that sex and gender um, are dimensions that must cut across overall mission, uh, overall mission to advance capacity for global health research, education, and communication. Let me also use this opportunity to underline that gender and global health should not be considered as a women only issue. It is an issue for all. Or as the French philosopher and great inspirator for many of us has expressed, women are not only females, they are also human beings. And likewise for men, they are not only human beings, as standard history often claims, they also have gender. So to me, this expression means that regardless of where we are in the world, every person is an individual with some human needs and rights. And at the same time, we know that in all regions, gender in terms of biology and specific social roles do shape people's chances and circumstances for good health. However, thanks to shared knowledge and dialogues across borders, we know that in, that in too many social contexts, women due to biology, childbirth and position as caregivers and often precarious breadwinners are especially vulnerable and suffer bad health. So before we continue, I would also uh, like to mention on the practical side, a few house rules for this event. When you register, registered, your, uh, you agree to the session being recorded so that we can make the link available to those not able to join live. All participants' microphones and videos will remain inactive throughout the event. And this webinar, webinar will consist of short presentations by each speaker, followed by a panel discussion and an open Q&A session moderated by myself. The panel discussion will include live language interpretation so that our audience can hear from our inspiring keynote speaker, Marcelina Boutsa, who will uh, be speaking in French. During this portion of the event, we encourage our audience to activate this function by clicking interpretation at the bottom of your Zoom screen and selecting whichever language you would like to listen to, French or English. So please note this function will only work during the panel discussion, um, discussion and should remain off until then. We also encourage the audience to engage with our speakers, of course, during the Q&A by posing questions. Please do so. You can uh, do that by using the Q&A button, also like located at the bottom of your screen. And this can be done either under your name or anonymously. So now the time has come to introduce our keynote speaker, Marcelina Butsa. Marcelina Butsa is a feminist and human rights defender from the Democratic Republic of uh, the uh, Democratic Republic Congo, known for her active work in defending human rights and empowering women in a country that has been, as you uh, know, plagued by civil war and corruption. In 2013, she founded the Rebuild Women's Hope Association and has worked tirelessly ever since to enable many women to regain economic independence and become active participants in society and the economy. Marceline has a clear vision for change and making a, a difference in the world. She has been actively engaged in the fight for women's rights and the empowerment of women in, uh, in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, which has been plagued not only by conflict and corruption, but also multiple violations of women's rights for more than two decades. Her fight has been recognized with various international and national recognitions, and as you know, the, the prize from University of Oslo. So now I will give the word to you, Marcelina. It's a great honor to have you with us.
je reprends au nom de l'ingénieur Marceline Boutia. Je suis la fondatrice, euh, la présidente du conseil d'administration de Rébu de notre organisation. Euh, je suis très contente parce que euh, j'ai été choisie euh, comme panéliste principale euh, pour traiter euh, sur le sujet Gender in Global Health Community, Engagement and Gender Equity. Et je suis vraiment très contente euh, parce que euh, j'ai été nommé euh, prix des droits de l'homme de l'Université de Soumou. Et c'est là que je vais un peu de vous expliquer sur comment l'autonomisation de la femme va de pair avec l'amélioration de la santé de la femme. Comme vous pouvez le voir, quand il y a implication de la femme dans les activités de développement de la communauté, cela fait assez qu'elle soit une actrice incontournable dans le développement socio-économique de la femme et ainsi que de sa communauté. Euh, cela, je l'ai vécu avec mon organisation Rivière de Monstrop. Euh, le café qui était considéré comme une culture de discrimination, une culture euh, qui, euh, dont la femme ne pouvait pas jouir de tout le droit, mais non aujourd'hui, elle est considérée comme une culture qui apporte la joie à cette femme, qui apporte euh, euh, la stabilité socio-économique. Pourquoi La femme, jadis, elle entrait dans les champs, elle travaillait la terre, elle travaillait le sol, elle faisait toute la chaîne de valeur de ce produit. Mais lors de la commercialisation, c'est l'homme qui se disait, ça c'est mon histoire. Et là, quand il récupérait, il, il récupérait l'affaire au niveau de la commercialisation, euh, la femme ne jouissait pas du travail de ses mains ainsi que de ses enfants. Et donc, elle devrait recourir, soit voler des petits trucs, des petites choses pour pouvoir subvenir aux besoins de sa famille. Et là, euh, quand nous sommes venus, nous avons pu apporter, euh, nous avons pu apporter, euh, la solution à ce problème-là. Nous avions sensibilisé les femmes à cultiver euh, ce café, mais aussi nous leur avons cherché le marché. Et là, euh, elles obtiennent le marché, là où elles peuvent vendre le café, on le met en contact avec les acheteurs. Et cela, euh, les femmes euh, gagnent leur vie et cela améliore les conditions de vie de leur maison ainsi que de la communauté. Et comme vous le voyez, la femme travaille ce café avec joie, avec amour, avec tendresse, car elle sait que euh, ce café euh, a une grande importance à ses yeux. Euh, ce café, c'est un café de développement de sa communauté. Ce café, c'est un café de développement de, de son entourage, de sa famille. Ce café, il apporte la joie de vivre. Ce café, c'est un café vraiment qui, qui apporte la paix, même dans sa famille. Et quand euh, nous parlons de l'autonomisation de la femme, nous devons faire allusion aux inégalités que les femmes faisaient face. Mais on le vit quand même aujourd'hui. Et ces inégalités-là entre hommes et femmes, ces vies sont de plan social, économique, politique, sanitaire, ainsi de suite. Là, les inégalités entre hommes et femmes alimentent souvent le sous-développement. Quand la femme n'est pas prise, à sa juste valeur. Quand la femme n'est pas prise à sa place, et là, cela occasionne des, des frustrations. Et là, elle, elle est paresseuse, elle ne travaille pas, et le, 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 le développement de la communauté est presque minime. Mais euh, quand le, la femme se voit garantir l'accès aux services et l'égalité des droits, cela crée en elle cet esprit-là de se battre cet esprit-là de développer sa communauté, cet esprit-là de travailler dur pour que euh, cet engagement-là, que ça soit, que ça impacte sur euh, lui-même, sa famille, ainsi que sa communauté. Et comme nous pouvons le dire, l'égalité des sexes et le développement durable sont deux choses qui vont de pair. Non, nous ne pouvons pas parler de, de l'égalité sans qu'il y ait euh, l'indépendance de la femme, sans qu'il y ait l'autonomisation 
de la femme. Et comme nous pouvons le dire, l'autonomisation économique des femmes peut apporter des gains substantiels en termes de développement humain, sanitaire et économique. Comme vous pouvez le voir là, il y a l'implication de femmes, euh, il y a l'implication des hommes, ils travaillent euh, pour euh, subvenir à leurs besoins, pour euh, améliorer les conditions de de, 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 de leur entourage. Comme vous pouvez le voir là, euh, quand l'homme et la femme travaillent, là, il y a le développement qui s'est fait. Comme vous le savez, nous sommes arrivés à, dans ce petit village, il n'y avait pas de maison. Et quand nous avions commencé cette activité-là, nous avions vu que la, 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 la situation de la, la, de la communauté, surtout de la femme, commençait à changer. Il y avait naissance de maison en tôle, avec des petits panneaux, euh, avec euh, des maisons vraiment en matériaux, tandis qu'avant, il n'y avait que des maisons en paille et des maisons couvertes par... Euh, donc, les maisons en argile couvertes par des pailles. Et donc, là, vous pouvez voir vraiment le vrai développement. Quand il y a implication de l'homme et de la femme, quand il y a égalité et il y a autonomisation de la femme, là, nous voyons directement qu'il y a... Euh, qui a euh, donc il y a évolution de la communauté, il y a un plus qui s'augmente dans la communauté et cela s'explique même dans la santé. Quand la femme travaille, là elle est à mesure de subvenir et même de prendre en charge les soins de santé. Comme vous le savez, pour les femmes pays, les femmes rurales, les femmes rurales n'ont pas souvent accès aux soins de santé de qualité parce que parfois euh, il euh, y a beaucoup de difficultés qui le freinent, comme par exemple, en se retrouvant sans argent, elles ont souvent tendance à recourir à la médecine traditionnelle, elles ont souvent euh, tendance à recourir à des charlatans, et cela occasionne beaucoup plus de cas de mort des enfants ainsi que de femmes. C'est dans ce même angle d'idée que, en travaillant le café, nous avions constaté que il y a euh, des taux de mortalité des femmes et des enfants étaient très élevés, et cela était en notre défaveur, car ces femmes-là, ces femmes-là qui travaillaient le café, ces femmes-là n'étaient pas n'étaient pas sécurisées sur le point sanitaire. Et là, nous nous sommes dit que nous allons leur venir à l'aide en construisant une clinique maternelle et pédiatrique. Euh, cette clinique-là leur, euh, leur, euh, leur favorise hein, euh, l'accès aux soins de santé de qualité. Et donc, euh, le, projet, donc le, le projet Café, euh, l'équipe de Rébus Bimitrop a fait assez avec les femmes. Il a autonomisé les femmes sur le point euh, café, sur le point d'activité génératrice de revenus, mais aussi sur le point sanitaire. Nous voyons vraiment qu'il y, euh, qu y, qu y, qu y a un grand changement. Et même dans le milieu, il y a les femmes. Les femmes qui, donc, les femmes qui étaient maladives. Et maintenant, là, elles ont retrouvé leur santé. Mais, qu'à cela ne tienne, l'accessibilité en eau était aussi un grand problème pour ces femmes-là. Donc, ces femmes-là, c'est lavé l'eau du lac. Elles faisaient tout avec l'eau du lac. Mais avec seule la culture du café, ils ont transformé ça. Le café a transformé à ce qu'il y ait des, comment dire, des projets sociaux qui s'occupent de, de, de l'addiction d'eau, donner l'eau, euh, euh, donc au village et donc ça euh, contribue à l'élimination des maladies hydriques et donc ça ça contribue à changer la femme mais aussi à changer son entourage et comme vous pouvez voir l'image là l'image l'explique l'image l'explique maintenant là les femmes sont en train de bénéficier des soins de santé il y a des mamans qui mettent au monde dans la clinique il y a des enfants qui présentaient de maladies un peu compliquées ils sont en train de recevoir les soins de santé de qualité et donc tu sens qu'il y a qu'il y a qu'il y a un certain développement dans la famille de, de dans la famille de petits producteurs, mais aussi dans la communauté, il y a euh, de nouveaux euh, de routes qui se créent. Et donc, vous voyez que quand on autonomise une femme, euh, je pense que on on les fait pour le bien de la communauté, car une femme c'est le poumon. Et on dit souvent que le revenu détenu par la femme impacte 
à le notre sang sur la vie de la famille ainsi que de la communauté. Mais euh, nous avions déjà parlé de, de problématiques sur la santé. Euh, nous, allons essayer, nous allons un peu essayer de parler sur euh, comment briser la violence contre les droits de la femme. Comme vous le savez, les femmes, dans, dans la tradition, ils n'avaient pas euh, droit à parler en public. Certains même n'avaient pas droit euh, d'étudier au même titre d'égalité que les hommes. Certains ont laissé toujours le pouvoir de décision à l'homme et la femme se voyait frustrée. Mais avec le temps, à nos jours, on est en train de sensibiliser les femmes sur leurs droits. On leur parle de leurs droits. Même l'article 14 de la constitution de notre pays en parle. Et donc, euh, on est en train de voir qu'il y a des améliorations petit à petit qui se font et la femme est en train de, de, de retrouver sa place sa place dans la communauté. Et donc, c'est le travail que nous devons maintenant continuer. Mon travail ainsi que le vôtre, de continuer à lutter à ce que la femme puisse accéder euh, à ses droits, mais aussi qu'on fasse comprendre aux hommes la place de la femme dans la famille ainsi que dans la communauté. Et là, nous n'allons pas euh, nous n'allons pas nous n'allons pas finir sans vous entendre parler ce que l'Université d'Oslo doit faire, euh, de, doit faire pour contribuer à améliorer euh, les conditions de la femme. Par exemple, on doit encourager et promouvoir les femmes dans la recherche. On doit garantir l'égalité entre les sexes, surtout dans les institutions. On doit assurer l'accès et la participation de la femme dans de grandes formations d'envergure. On doit promouvoir les activités de la femme. On doit établir un système de mentorat en vue de permettre euh, et faciliter les échanges entre les femmes. On doit euh, s'investir dans l'éducation et la formation de ces femmes car cela apporte un bénéfice dans la société et ainsi que dans euh, la vie de, de la femme. Au fait, euh, je vous remercie pour cette petite présentation et je pense que euh, euh, bon, cela sera euh, un coup, un coup d'appel à ce que tout le monde puisse lutter pour euh, l'autonomisation de la femme car cela a beaucoup, impacte beaucoup sur la vie de la femme. Et sur, la, et sur le point sanitaire, et sur le point d'éducation, et la politique, ainsi de suite. Merci. Thank you so much, uh, Marceline, for your talk. It was so inspiring, and it indeed showed us all uh, the broad approach we need to, to, to apply when striving for better health for all. And it also showed us how Well, you deserve the prize in 2020, the Human Rights Prize from the University of Oslo. So thank you so much. It really um, uh, made a good platform for continuing our uh, event. And now it's a um, pleasure for me to introduce um, the panelists or the speaker. And uh, the first uh, to come is um, Jon Åge Eislebø. He is um, the first resident ambassador in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where he presented his credentials in January 2021. Uh, as a former journal journalist, he has worked extensively within communication and cultural promotion, but also on international development, trade policy, and political affairs. Former diplomatic postings include South Africa, US, Switzerland, Mozambique, Poland, and Morocco. So we will now um, uh, hear his presentation. The word is yours, uh, Jonoga Eisleba. Good morning, all. I regret not being able to join you in real time today but I'm with you in spirit 
and in this pre-recorded video. First of all, I would like to congratulate the Center for Global Health at the University of Oslo on their selection of a new cross-cutting topic. Gender in global health is a highly relevant choice, as I'm sure the event today will show. Also, I take this opportunity, slightly belatedly, to congratulate Marceline Boudsa on being awarded the University of Oslo Human Rights Award for 2020, a year that imposed limitations on all of us in terms of both traveling and getting together for events. One day soon, Madame Budsa, I hope to see you in Kinshasa or in Goma or in Oslo to celebrate the award properly. As many of you are well aware, gender aspects of global health have for years been among the top priorities for Norway's development policy. Politically, through our participation in various configurations around uh, the world, including with the United Nations, and on the ground through Norwegian development programs in various countries. I currently live and work in a country that is particularly hard hit in many ways. The Democratic Republic of Congo has the highest proportion of people in need of humanitarian assistance, around 28%. Basic public services like health and education are at best inadequate. And in the eastern part of the country, where illegal mining is a driver of conflict and suffering, dozens of armed groups exercise their influence through attacks on civilians, including women and children. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, preventable diseases like cholera, typhoid and malaria are widespread. The latest outbreak of Ebola has only recently been put down and COVID-19 has of course added to the suffering. No one knows how many have died from it, but there is good reason to believe that the number is much higher than official statistics show. From my Kinshasa perspective, it's easy to see that the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic is not only a health crisis, it has also drastically impacted the socio-economic situation for millions of people. And it has brought about a wide-reaching human rights crisis. In all of these areas, girls and women are disproportionately and negatively affected. Existing vulnerabilities, whether health-related or socio-economic, have been amplified. For more than a year now, hospitals and clinics all over the world have had to give less attention to maternal health, not to speak of how sexual and reproductive health services have been hit. Besides, since women account for the majority of health workers, they are also more exposed to the pandemic. And as if that was not enough, we have seen an incre increase in gender-based violence, including through domestic violence in DRC and in other countries in Africa and elsewhere in the world. Figures from UNDP and UN Women indicate that due to COVID-19, the global poverty rate for women will probably increase by about 9% from 2019 to 2021. This contrasts with pre-COVID estimates, which pointed towards a reduction of 2.7% for the same period. So what can and will Norway do about this? Well, first of all, politically, Norway will continue to defend established norms and universal rights. We are facing pushbacks at the moment in the UN concerning the normative standards on gender equality, including in relation to sexual and reproductive health and rights. So that is why it's important to continue to support efforts to expand access to sexual and reproductive health services for all. That is why it's important to expand access to contraception 
and secure the right to safe abortion. That is why it's important to provide comprehensive education on human sexuality and secure freedom from violence and harmful practices such as female, female genital mutilation and child marriage. Norway will also continue to support both UN agencies and civil society organizations. Um, Norway committed Norway is committed to invest approximately 10.4 billion Norwegian kroner, that's 1.25 billion US dollars, in sexual and reproductive health and rights for the period 2020 to 2025. This includes 760 million kroner in the period 2020 to 23 for following up our strategy against harmful practices that was launched in 2019. This strategy aims at combating practices such, such as forced marriage, female genital mutilation and the widespread preference for sons. More specifically, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, we will continue to support efforts by various UN bodies and dedicated organizations like Norwegian Church Aid and Caritas to alleviate the impact on people's lives, including women's lives. And my colleague Antonia Kremer will be able to elaborate more on this during the uh, panel session. I think I will stop there. Thank you all for listening to me and I wish you a rewarding event. Thank you very much uh, to Jon Oge Eyslubbe and uh, good luck with your further uh, work and the representation of uh, Norway in uh, DRC. Uh, I am then pleased to introduce to you the next presenter, Samira Kudrago is co-founder and chair of the Women in Global Health Francophone West Africa chapter. Uh, she's also the co-founder and scientific director of the African Group Organized for Research and Action in Health and the association African Crossroad Development. As a researcher, consultant and advocate in population and global health, uh, she has spe specific research interests, including health systems improvement, infectious diseases, cancer, sexual and reproductive health, and human rights. She has built capacities in the design, implementation, and evaluation of public health programs and interventions. Throughout her academic and work experience, she has provided leadership and technical assistance on diverse project in Sub-Saharan Africa, France, the UK, and Canada. Her work has always been oriented towards health equity and social justice. Dr. Kueda Rago is member of the Gavi CSO board constituency. She will be co-chairing the OR Tambo African Research Chair in the Research and Action Against Cancer and the University Joseph Kizerbo in Cuadrogo in Burkina Faso. So please, uh, Dr. Uh, Samira, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. I would like, first of all, to thank the Center for Global Health for giving me the opportunity to contribute to this panel discussion. I have co-founded Women in Global Health Francophone West Africa, and I'm currently leading the movement. Women in Global Health globally is an organization built on a global movement with the largest network of women and allies working to challenge power and privilege for gender equity in health. It started in 2015 and it has grown. It includes more, now more than 50,000 supporters in 90 countries. And officially it has 25 registered chapters and with the strongest, strongest presence in low and middle income countries. The global team uh, of women in global health and the network of chapter drive change by mobilizing a diverse group of women, emerging women leaders or already recognized leaders in their countries, advocating to existing global health leaders to commit 
to transform their own institution and also holding these leaders accountable. Available data suggests that women represent 70% of the global health workforce, but only 25% of these women hold leadership roles. And even data are worse in low and middle in income countries, especially in Africa and West, Af West Sub Saharan Africa or West Africa. Only, data suggests that only 10% of women hold leadership roles in health sector. This happened more than 25 years after the agreement at the Beijing meeting, highlighting the importance and the necessity to remove the systematic barriers that hold women back from equal participation in all areas of public and private life. The pandemic has confirmed that we rely really on frontline workers. The majority of these workers are women and, and they have put themselves in harm's way. Many of them are working without adequate personal protective equipment. In many in low income countries, especially in Sub Saharan Africa, frontline workers, frontline female workers, especially those working in community health, in community, as community health care workers, are underpaid or even in unpaid. Let me just uh, highlight some findings from the women in global for women in global health and finds jointly published report which is the first comprehensive evidence review and analysis of COVID-19 diagnosis and testing related to the situation of women in low and middle income countries. The sole study uh, found by the report show that uh, the availability, the uh, scarcity, scarcity of data in low and middle income countries and found that only 1% of primary healthcare facilities have access to essential diagnostics. A study performed in Senegal, which is in West Africa, found that only 13% of women received the complete set of antenatal tests recommended during pregnancy during the pandemic. The, the gendered barriers women face to access testing are compound to women living in humanitarian settings, those marginalized, those uh, those measure through uh, geographic location, ethnicity, disability, occupation, and so on. This is also true for immunization. Yet, we, we know that 70% of the global health work, workforce are women, 90% of nurses and mis, midwives, and the majority of healthcare workers in, are working in primary, in primary care centers. Women are doing incredible work in their communities to, to, to control disease. However, they are not always enabled to deliver testing, to deliver care in general. They are not paid fairly or adequately trained and enabled, enabled and resourced. Women are at the heart of diagnosis, vaccine delivery, and different uh, health system uh, accessibility. In their roles as wives, mothers, and community influencers, women have a key role in promoting testing and immunization for families in general and for their communities. It's our duty to build a gender equal post-COVID-19 world. This is probably this will probably be facilitated by the growing number of gender equity movement. But it's important to pay special attention to regional differences. Build and strengthen gender equity movement in underserved and underrepresented countries, communities in general. Especially because women from these communities are exposed to under to intersectional factors which may leave them behind and create inequities in our progress toward gender equity. It's important to contextualize and understand the issues involved in, gen in barriers to gender equity locally. 
We need experts who understand the control of the issues to help develop what will be or what will constitute a truly novel solution. Not just experts working in beautiful offices, but also people working on the field for grassroots grass movements. They are usually the one that are aware of power balance and local realities. Everyone has the right to attain equal level of participation in leadership and decision making, regardless of gender and social origin. To meet sustainable development goal five worldwide, we need to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you very much, Samira, for your uh, speech. I, I, I really think you showed how gendered inequalities in, in health and health systems are and, and, and also the knowledge and, and, and efforts and leadership that is needed to, to change that. So thank you very much. We will now move over to our next um, uh, expert in the panel. And it's a pleasure for me to welcome um, Anders Seim. Anders is a medical doctor working on key issues like keeping women alive at childbirth through large scale interventions in Africa, using collaboration between communities and uh, health systems, combined with scientifically well documented, very low cost medicines and technologies. So the word is yours, Anders. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> If we can share the screen here, if this works. It looks like it works. Uh, the question we've been asked is, in what ways can increased community engagement provide a pathway to women's independence, better health and socioeconomic development? And I would propose to you that survival is a good place to start. Seven minutes, just a taste. Community. This gentleman you see on the screen of my computer in May is a doctor in Vanga Health Zone in the Democratic Republic of Congo, who took contact with me after being introduced by colleagues at the Liverpool University in the United Kingdom. He's gathered a community of nurses, midwives, doctors, and medical students uh, around him one weekend day to hear presentation and talk and discussion by a colleague in Niger over Skype, uh, describing what Niger has done to cut its maternal mortality from women bleeding to death in half within two years on a nationwide scale. And that uh, computer is placed on a chair in my kitchen because while the colleague in Niger was describing an excellent French, which I don't speak, uh, certainly not excellently, uh, we were demonstrating some of the equipment and techniques with my wife serving as a model as I was demonstrating this anti-shock garment from our kitchen floor in Norway near the North Pole, so to speak. This is Niger. The hills in the background are Mali. The foreground is Niger. There's nothing out there, but there are people everywhere. Community. This is a bed in the building where the only midwife that served 100,000 people had her uh, facilities. She had one bed where women could be in labor uh, during opening phases of childbirth. And she had one piece of equipment donated by UNICEF. It's exactly identical to what they weighed me with when I was born at the University Hospital in Oslo in 1948. The difference between the University of Oslo even then and this place is that's the only piece of equipment that she had to help her as she's helping women to deliver babies. The only midwife for 100,000 people. The nearest doctor was a lone doctor when this started, 120 kilometers away, and he served 596,000 people. Community. 
the initial project was to prevent obstetric fistula and prevent women dying from obstructed childbirth, blocked childbirth, obstructed labor. And the sun must never, ever rise more than once over a woman giving birth anywhere. 100% almost of this population is illiterate, but these people are obviously just as bright as everyone attending this event. They just have not to have gone to school. There's a lot of things they do very well, including diagnosing sunrise with extreme precision. And so the populations and the communities will understand what it means when they comprehend the sun must never rise more than once over a woman giving birth. The rest is communications and logistics and pre-planned evacuations to pre-selected hospitals. Community. There are three problems. A woman dies giving birth somewhere in the world every one or two minutes. Babies die too. Three and a half percent of the babies were born dead or died within three days in the project area when this pilot started in 2008. And the third is obstetric fistula, which means women leaking for the rest of their life after a childbirth that lasted too long. Two million women will have it and 50 to 130,000 women experience it each year. It's permanent, lifelong, unless you get surgery that succeeds, which it doesn't always. Another problem is people bleeding to death. 18% of women, up to 18% bleed too much if nothing is done. And 10.5% bleed over a liter if nothing is done, according to WHO global average. And the time from women start bleeding till they die can be two hours and less. The principles that Niger is using to prevent that tragedy across its entire territory, some parts of which you've seen photos from, are to prevent, measure, and treat in that order. Prevention uses the beneficial side effect of an ulcer medication. Two tablets of misoprostol prevents 70% of women from bleeding too much if they receive a dose immediately after they give birth. And the beneficial side effect of the ulcer medicine is that it causes the uterus to contract. If she bleeds too much anyway, then four tablets is hugely effective in stopping the bleeding for a great number of women. If she's still bleeding after 25 minutes, not when you come back from lunch or when you think about it, but 25 minutes on the clock, you go to step two, which is condom tamponade. We pack them in kits, as you see in a plastic uh, to the left, and it's ordinary condoms, ordinary string, a suction catheter because they're cheaper than urinary catheters, and a syringe that you can fill up to 300, 500 milliliters of water. There's a pair of gloves because if you don't have gloves otherwise, which people often don't, you certainly need one when you're putting something into a bleeding woman's uterus to protect her and protect yourself. And there's antibiotics because we put unsterile but clean things inside somebody's body cavity where there's a lot of blood around which bacteria enjoy. So she's given a, an antibiotic umbrella. If she's still bleeding after six minutes or at most 12 minutes, 12 minutes, not very long, you go to step three, which is the anti-shock garment you saw being demonstrated uh, and get her to surgery in a predetermined definitive treatment center, even if it's far away and optimize the impact of existing resources, however meager they might be using organizational tools from disease eradication efforts. This is not a vertical program. This is a bridge between vertical and horizontal programs. If somebody has appendicitis tonight, somebody has to be able to be focused enough to do the surgery. Somebody has to give the anesthesia. It needs focus even in a system that's strengthening health systems. We've already made sure that this beautiful, gorgeous little girl in South Sudan is never going to have guinea worm disease, a parasitic disease, which is not to the topic of today's discussion. The point here is that when she grows up, we need to make sure that she can give birth and never have obstetric fistula and not bleed to death, just like all the other beautiful girls and women that exist in the world. We've known basically exactly what to do for 100 years. We now have additional new technologies with some of these medicines, which they did not have 100 years ago. 
And it's about, we just need to get ourselves organized and sorted and, and do it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anish, um, for talking about survival. It's, it sounds like it's a really good place to start. And, and uh, um, it was very inspiring and also very concrete for some of us who are not um, into the, this part of uh, medicine. That. Uh, we will now uh, proceed and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, our next speaker, Nora Sveos. Uh, Nora is a professor emeritus at the Department of Psychology, University in Oslo. And in her research, as well as in clinical work, she has focused on psychological consequences of severe human rights violations, in particular of torture, including sexual um, gender-based violence in conflict. Initiator and head of mental health and human rights info, a Norwegian NGO, member of the UN subcommittee on the prevention of torture and former member of UN Committee Against Torture as well. And um, uh, as many of you know, also she received the University of Oslo's Human Rights Prize in 2018. So it's a great pleasure for us to have you with us, Nora, and uh, you will talk about mental health consequences of sexual violence in conflict. The word is yours. <laughs> To, to this important event. And I also want to thank the host and the presenters today that have shown such a wide range of the problem that we are discussing, namely health and gender related issues in relation to health. And what I'm going to touch upon today very, very briefly, this deserves a lot more time and, uh, and, and focus, it's on the mental health consequences of sexual violence in conflict. Because unfortunately, sexual violence in conflict is probably one of the very severe forms of violence against women throughout the world, in particular in conflict and war-related situations. So I will say some words about this, about health consequences, and also some attempts to, to deal with this, or at least to provide some support to, to the survivors. Next. Next. So what are we talking about? Rape and different forms of sexual violence in war represent extremely serious threat to the integrity and the dignity of women who are subjected to this, the mental health and the person exposed. A trauma, it's a trauma that changes life and it does create vulnerability in most people. Often there's very limited support to those who are subjected to this form of violence. And they are often also met with shame and marginalization. They may feel shame in themselves. They feel that they have been in the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, or they have just not been able to protect themselves, which is absolutely a very normal thing to feel. But it's also unfortunate that in many contexts, people who have been exposed to these severe forms of violence are not included in their own society anymore. This we have seen in many places where conflict in conflict context. So again, this makes the situation even more uh, problematic for those who experience these forms of violences. This is a violence that affects not only the individual, but also the fam family and the community. And I would especially then raise the awareness of the community responsibility to deal with these things in the aftermath. And of course, we have the children born of rape, which are frequently in a very, very dire situation. Next. The problem is a huge problem, uh, unfortunately, and there are numbers saying that even in places where there are conflict and, and war, even up to 70% of women may be exposed to different forms of sexual violence. This is, of course, very dif difficult to know exactly, but the problem is huge. And in the words of Navi Pillai, who is the former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, she has put very clear words on this namely saying that the victims of sexual violence bear the cost of the harm that they suffered with dramatic physical, psychological, and material consequences, which destroy not only their lives, but often also the lives of their children. And it creates irreparable damage to the very fabric of society and in turn poses serious threats 
to the prospects of reconciliation and sustainable peace and development. And I think she's putting the word very clearly to this extreme problem and also underlining why uh, sexual violence in war and conflict has often been termed uh, tools of war or weapons of war. Next. What did we know about sexual and gender-based violence in war and conflict between 1990? Actually, very little. It was an unreported problem, definitely with impunity. Uh, soldiers or, or other personnel may have done these uh, serious forms of violations without any forms of reactions or repercussions to them. They were not convicted, they were, it was not investigated. It has been seen as something that always happens at war. Uh, it, uh, and nothing, and then it has nothing to be dealt with. It was not considered as any human rights agenda at all. I can remember myself going to Geneva in 1980, asking for support uh, for programs to assist women in these situations based on human rights and torture conventions and prohibitions, and was told that, sorry, this is not part of the, the, the human rights agenda. Fortunately, this has changed a lot. And today, sexual violence against women are seen not only as a severe human rights violations, it's a, it's a, it's a crime against humanity and it's a, it's a war crime. And it was also not considered politically relevant till the wars in the 1990s, very little systematic research, and of course, very little focus on the survivors. Next. But with the dramatic war both in Bosnia-Herzegovina and the, the genocide in Rwanda, and later on also Congo and Sudan, we have heard very serious and, and extremely abundant, two abundant stories about systematic rape, systematic violations of women, uh, very high numbers. We do have the documentation today, and we do, we do see not only uh, the numbers, we see the effects, and there's also a growing and strong focus on the health and the mental health consequences of these forms of violations. Next. So one of the important aspects that have been that we have seen is the fact that UN adopted resolutions. It started with the 2000 uh, 1325 resolution. That's probably the most uh, famous of them all. Uh, also referred to uh, by the by the ambassador, but we also have the, re the resolutions from 2008 and 2009 and later on also underlining the, the absolute prohibition on, on sexual violence as a conflict of war and tactic in war. And also the one from 2009 that I particularly uh, like, namely underlying state parties uh, obligations also to provide psychosocial support, including, of course, also legal assistance and socioeconomic integration for victims of sexual violence. Next. So having, having said this, we can ask ourselves, what is the support that is provided to women exposed to these violations? What happens to the survivors? She has managed to keep alive, but her life is extremely changed, and she may feel that she may never ever come back to a situation where she, she can live as she did before. So a group of us psychologists and psychiatrists in Norway, having worked internationally uh, in war zone and after war zone with women who have been who, have, who are survivors of sexual violence and conflict, decided we wanted to support the helpers in the communities by developing some, some guidelines and some manual uh, that could be used on a very low level, so to speak, could very, very used on a very, let's say, not a specialist level, but on a first, first helpers level, which is what most people will meet and who also need support. We had all been vi visiting places and we had all spoken to helpers who would be very reluctant even to approach women who had been exposed to sexual violence because of fear of making the, the harm even worse. So developing this over years uh, and, and it has now been translated to a number of, of uh, languages and you can find it through the links that I will provide you with. Uh, this is a way to give some tools and assistance to those who are helping the survivors directly. Next. Because approaching Approaching this issue, there is and, and there is a very strong need to establish good mental health assistance and support women who have suffered from this sort of violence. And we're not speaking about therapy. That may come later on. We're speaking about uh, about uh, really basic support, also having having the information and being gender based uh, informed uh, on these issues. So. 
I think that the most important thing we can do is to try to support the community and community helpers to provide mental health and psychosocial support to those who are in need of this. So what we have developed is a training manual for the helpers themselves. Next. And yes, what has been highlighted in this manual, it's first of all that the traumatic event leaves serious wounds. There's no doubt it leaves serious wounds. And we will speak about that probably later on. At the same time, it's important to focus on hope, strength, and resources. We cannot just stop with saying that this is a trauma and there it stops. It has to move on because the woman wants to go back to her community. She wants to go back to her life. She needs support to gain her strength and to gain her control again over her own life and let not let alone to, to be reminded of her own dignity and her, her value that she may often feel is lost and gone. It's not approaching this as a diagnostic tool, but it's, a, it's supposed to be a resource-oriented approach involving support persons and community. Also placing the traumatic event in time and life, underlying that this is an unjust and completely illegitimate and prohibited act, and that she needs to be, again, uh, supported to re regain her life and to feel that she is she is in, in fact in control over her own life, emphasizing dignity and survival and that no brutality can take this away. Next. We use the uh, butterfly woman metaphor in the manual, and this is very much inspired by the work that was done also in, in Congo by colleagues and, and helpers who did a wonderful job there. It's a way of trying to speak about what has happened without necessarily speaking directly about my my own experience as a survivor. This may be good to many people who may feel that uh, indirect approaches to severe trauma is one way of doing it, and this is further elaborated. So. I will move on to close my presentation. So the importance is that we highlight here in the manual a gender-based approach and a human rights-based approach, because we see the violence that has been committed as serious human rights violation. And for those who are helping, it may often be a good framework to understand these violations as, as, as severe human rights violations, and also perhaps see themselves as a kind of a human rights defender themselves. And, and, and it's important to walk the talk to in our work with survivors to, to really show respect to their to their mental and health, uh, mental and physical integrity, and also to use international principles on human rights as guiding principles of justice, including also focus on justice. Many will feel the need to have to have things reported to see that there's justice done after what they have experienced. And this is also part of the discussions. Underlying again, the responsibility of states to prevent violence and abuse, prohibit, prohibit these forms of ill treatments and provide protection and assistance to survivors. Again, looking back at the, 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 the Security Council resolutions I mentioned. So with these very few words, I hope to have said some words about this extremely devastating form of violations during war and conflict, the severe consequences for those who are exposed, and also that there may be some, some hope in, this, uh, in the assistance and support we can give to helpers for them again to be ready to give the assistance and support to women, to their families, and to their communities. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you so much, Nora, for your talking us through sexual uh, gender-based violence as one of the most important aspects of, of gender across the world. And of course, uh, your uh, uh, way of underlying how strongly this is also connected to human rights in order to, to create hope and, and, and justice. So um, by that, we are now uh, uh, heading on for uh, the panel discussion and the Q&As. And before starting that, I would also like to um, uh, introduce um, uh, the person who is standing in for Jon Olga Eislebø. Uh, namely Anthony Kramer. Uh, Anthony Lysov Kramer is the ambassador counselor at the Royal Norwegian uh, Embassy in Kinshasa. And she has previously worked for UNDP in Madagascar and the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation, Murat, in Norway. 
Um, she holds a PhD in social anthropology from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the, from, uh, at the University in London. So welcome to you as well, uh, Anthony. Um, now, uh, you are more than also more than welcome now to, to put questions uh, uh, in the Q&A um, field. And also, please remember the interpreter button since we are doing both English and French in this event. So um, just to start a little bit softly um, with a panel discussion, I would like to go back to you, Marceline. Um, having especially Nura's uh, presentation in mind. Um, I just wonder uh, why should the issue of gender-based violence in rural areas be a priority for international organizations, governments and embassies? And maybe you can also connect this to your own um, uh, experience and, and approach from your organization. Okay, merci beaucoup pour la parole. <clears throat> Thank you very much for giving me the floor. I think that the question of maternal health should be of great importance. Oh dear, the sound is lost. Mm. It is indeed what happens is that we are rather weak uh, in towards the government. Those our governments do not invest in health institutions. They are more interested in in the cities and the rural populations are left to their own devices and therefore they do not have any access to quality health services. So they use traditional medicines or they are they have recourse to quacks. Sound difficulty here, sorry. Uh, the interpreter cannot hear Maslin. In 2019, we noticed that there are huge sums of money uh, which were earmarked for health in rural areas. But when you come to the rural areas, you can see how poor they are, extremely poor. The population is suffering. And I think that organizations, embassies should actually be present and should really finance sustainable projects. Health, for instance, because the, it's the women, the children who are going to benefit from all this. Now, of course, in towns, in cities, you have hospitals. It's not difficult to have access to health uh, uh, services, where, whereas in rural areas, they, they don't exist. And when they do exist, the costs are prohibitive for the populations. Sorry. So for me, the international organization, the embassies should really invest in the real needs of the population, the actual real needs in sustainable projects, health, for instance. Finished. Thank you so much, Marceline. Um, I think I will uh, move over to, to um, uh, Samira. Uh, so, um, I, I just wonder what is Women in Global Health doing to increase underserved and underrepresented women's voices in decision making in global health? You, you certainly talk about that. Could you be even more specific? I would like to thank you for your interesting question. And I also want to say that Women in Global Health is working toward the implementation of country and regional chapters. So this, this allow uh, tailoring needs to each context. So you have heard Marceline describing the context in her community. 
she knows best what is good for her community. She knows what, yeah. uh, what strategy can work and she knows how it's, we can implement this. So it's important for us, on, uh, for women in global health, to give a power to women in the, on the field, like Marceline, to, to be the, the, the voice of the community and mm -hmm. also to be our guide, help us strengthen community and help our community. For example, in, in the 10 countries that constitute the Francophone chapter, we are working to help women build confidence in themselves, develop communication and leadership skills, because this is not something we taught them. This is not something they are being uh, enabled to do. It's important to give them tools and to also help them, guide them toward uh, uh, global health, the global health sector. We are working to help them build a strong network in global health, which will help them access opportunities and also access strategies that could that have worked in some part of the world and that could also be tailored and implemented in their context. So Amish, I was really excited by your, your presentation and, and um, it was a really novel a way of working with uh, maternal uh, mortality. So is it possible for you to tell us some numbers of how many lives you saved by this intervention? We have uh, information on something over 1.4 million health facility births in Niger across the country since they implemented that uh, in, in 2013 initially. And then it really got started after some problems getting stuff out of customs and so on by 2015. The number of lives saved is a bit difficult. We're hoping for funding from something called unit aid for three different countries in West Africa, which will include a survey of, there's a community component of it as well, giving misoprostol to women to take home with them at their third trimester prenatal consultation if they come for one and encourage them to give birth in a health setting. But if they don't, to take two tablets, if they don't reach on time, immediately after the baby's out and they've palpated their tummy to make certain there's not another twin inside. Right. So we'll see about that. The, the economic calculations indicate that the cash savings to the population is probably on the order of 12 times the running costs. Um, and the costs per person in the population is the order of about three US dollar cents, uh, three cents, three pennies. Uh, per year per person in the population, uh, per disability adjusted life year saved. It's a little more expensive than the $2 uh, of an EPI expanded program immunization program. Mm -hmm. It's at the level of probably $5.42 from what we could see, which is still half of what bednet programs cost. It's uh, a tenth, it's a, less than that of, of $104 surgery improved overall maternal child health costs $163, and this is $5 per uh, disability adjusted life year prevented in both severe uh, anemia uh, losses, economic losses, and women's uh, lives saved who otherwise would have died, as well as babies dying. I mean, when mothers die, their children survive much, much less often sure. than if the mother's alive. So, yeah. yeah, the quick answer. Well, thank you for elaborating on that. It's very interesting. So <clears throat> I think I also wanted to pick up on, on uh, Nora's uh, presentation. And uh, you, you mentioned during your presentation, uh, you expressed this, the Syrian's wounds that the, the, the victims are, are uh, have to live with uh, mm. after being exposed for violence. Could you, could you explain to us a little bit what it means to a woman to be expo mm. e exposed? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yes, I, I, think, I think I will start saying that it is, it's important that we remember that this form of violence 
sexual gender-based violence represents an extremely brutal attack on those on women and for that matter also men and boys we must not remember that it happens it happens to 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 all but it's it's a form of a, a brutal attack that that it in some way feels that your your integrity and your your feeling of who you are and what you are is is gone it's a life threatening event and many experience that their lives uh, are being lost even if they do survive and i think one of the things that we're trying to communicate also to the helpers is to have is to en en encourage them to have a conversation of what frequently happens with people after having been uh, been through such an experience because many people think that they have lost their mind completely because the the, the marks and the the suffering keeps in their body as well as in their mind and just just the nightmares many may feel the feeling that they cannot even go out to to the market because this the smells the sounds may remind them of something that we would call triggers um, make people feel that they have lost control over their lives and they may they may withdraw they may feel that they cannot even be part of the community anymore which is a very very bad and very vicious circle so 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 trying to explain what frequently happens to persons who have been unfortunate enough to be exposed to such a situation where they're absolutely very often unprotected because it's them and and the power and a feeling of being unprotected and again then a feeling of being no worth nobody can can do anything for me and this in a way keeps keeps as a thought and as a as an understanding of themselves and is trying to turn this and say this is actually what happens to most people and it's it's a way this is the part of the trauma itself and it's a way of there's a way out of this by understanding that you must gain control. So there's a lot of, in, in our tools, we have, have a lot of suggestions as to ways of both self-instructions, exercises, relaxation techniques, things like that, in order to try to say, okay, this is what they planted in me, so to speak. My, my, my life is to be taken back and I must fight the reminders. I must fight all these elements that, that uh, threaten to make my daily life impossible. And I think also just to, to say that, the, the, and what we have seen so, so clearly today, the importance of having an integrated approach because it's not mental health in an isolation. Not, it, I would think both Samira um, and Marcella, Marceline have been speaking about in, engagement and active meaningful life is let alone physical health. Um, and survival, how important it is to look at this as, as one big pack, not isolate the different forms of help and health measures from each other. Thank you. Thank you, Nora, for, for, for your, your great uh, reply. And uh, I, I think also uh, I would like to include Anthony. If, are you there with the camera or can you hear us? There you are. <laughs> yes. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Nice to have you with us. So we heard the ambassadors' presentations and uh, are a little bit curious um, if you could elaborate on how how uh, Norway is promoting gender and global health globally and in the Democratic Republic of of uh, Congo. Yes. Um, thank you so much. Uh, so first of all, uh, uh, I really want to thank you for arranging this uh, this event. I've been taking lots of notes. I'm so impressed by all the all the panelists, uh, and uh, and as we just opened the Norwegian embassy, as as the ambassador mentioned in in January of this year, uh, we are definitely in a learning phase, and and this uh, seminar has been extremely useful for us. Uh, so thank you so much for the for the opportunity and for inviting us. And, and um, when it comes to the how globally Norway is is working on human uh, well women's rights in in global health, uh, I think the the ambassador's intervention covered a lot. Uh, so basically, to summarize, it's focusing on promoting global norms and and universal rights, including the universal healthcare agenda uh, and women. And, uh, rights within this agenda, uh, and as well as uh, supporting financially uh, the the big both the, in the UN system and and civil society working on these issues, uh, and also I could I should probably mention that Norway is also promoting this within other um, avenues for global financing, including including the international financial partners like the World Bank, 
who obviously have a lot of resources and where Norway has been contributing to channeling some of those resources more specific, specifically towards the issues of promoting um, global health and women's, uh, women's rights within global health. Um, so um, I could also talk more about what we do in the DRC, uh, if that's okay. Yeah, please do. Okay. Uh, yeah, so in the DRC more specifically, uh, we have the same approach uh, of having um, both having a political uh, dialogue with the with the government here, and that's obviously been greatly helped by having a full embassy established and an ambassador who can have a dialogue with both ministers and uh, and the head of state. Uh, and then we also have a, a more specific development support. Um, for the moment, we are supporting um, more um, of the so-called multilateral channels, that is the UN agencies, uh, and on the humanitarian side, we support also the big uh, NGOs. Uh, we still have quite a small presence in the DRC, so we don't have a lot of specific uh, support directly to the national civil society. Uh, I think that's really unfortunate, uh, and listening to Marceline and colleagues, I would say that would be, have been something very interesting for now, um, not something we, we are doing, but something over a longer term we should be looking at once we have the full embassy established and everybody um, here re recruited. I mean, we are really still in the face of, of being established here. Um, but otherwise, what I can mention is that we, we do, um, we have a lot of um, thematic focus areas. We don't have a specific thematic focus area on health in the DRC, uh, simply because that has not been a, a particular priority here. We have a big investment in the area of climate and forest and natural resource management, where gender is always a cross-cutting concern in terms of including women who are obviously the majority of smallholder farmers actually women, and it's very important to include women's perspective and natural resources, including women's access to land. So we are working on those issues, but more indirectly. Uh, and there is also a component actually on access to uh, reproductive health as part of this um, very uh, large overarching climate and forest initiative, where we work with several other donors as well. Um, apart from that, we also, and that is our biggest, definitely our biggest contribution here, it's about $40 million per year, and much larger than the other initiatives we have directly in the DRC. Uh, other issues are, other, other ways of supporting women and global health are through our humanitarian support. Uh, where it obviously focuses on the, the supporting the national humanitarian response plan as well as specific you know, humanitarian um, challenges, but where Norway always seeks to promote uh, women's inclusion and supporting women's organizations. Uh, and one specific priority is, uh, is supporting the combat against uh, sexual and gender-based violence in conflict, where we've had some excellent presentations in the seminar. Uh, and so uh, I've been... I'll be delighted to follow up with, with those experts because they clearly have a lot of insights that would be useful for the embassy. Uh, specifically on, on that issue, we have been supporting the Norwegian Church Aid, who have a partnership with, uh, with the, the Nobel laureate, uh, Dr. Uh, Dennis Mukwege, who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2019, particularly for his fight against uh, gender-based violence as a weapon of war. Um, and uh, so our support are, of him is, is one of the many avenues where we're also promoting this issue of combating gender-based violence. Uh, I think what has been clear in the DRC is that sexual violence has been a, a weapon uh, in war, but also is more of a widespread structural challenge in society, which has been really torn apart by conflict and where women have been excluded. So I would just want to point that out towards the end. I'm no expert on this issue, but I understand from experts that uh, gender-based violence should not be just considered as a challenge in war, but also a structural challenge to society that needs to be um, challenged here in the DRC and indeed globally as well. Um, very briefly to wrap up, uh, we are also supporting uh, food security and reconciliation in the DRC with a, with a focus again on women's, uh, women's rights. Uh, and uh, also human rights in general through the UN system here. Uh, and finally, we have a new program on combating modern slavery, uh, which was launched by the Minister of Development in 2019. And for the DRC, the focus is particularly on mining and, and um, promoting women and children's rights in artisanal mining. 
Um, so I think I will stop uh, on that because I don't want to take too much time, but look forward to the further exchanges. Thank you. Thank you so much, Antony. That was really interesting and, and uh, enlightening. And, uh, not, and of course, uh, <laughs> to many impress and taken into account that you've been uh, so shortly in, in, in the DRC, but of course, it's well, it sounds well, also well prepared. So that I think also now we have opened up for questions from the audience. And uh, so I, uh, I will start with one question that uh, actually relates very well to you, Anthony, again. It's, uh, it's from um, Linda Rusta. And her question is uh, to you, Anthony. She asked, do the embassy cooperate with higher education institutions on women and health in DRC? And in that, uh, if that's the case, could you please tell us how you cooperate? And uh, what do you see as the most important contribution from higher education institutions in Norway regarding women and health? <laughs> that was a kind of package for you, but you can select. Thank you so much. And I think I actually know Linda from my former life in NORAD. So Ooh. thank you very much, Linda, for, for um, this excellent question. Uh, and that uh, was great also because I, I sort of forgot to mention one other program that we support here. Um, through the Norwegian uh, International Development Agency, NORAD, there is a specific project supporting higher education and research. It's in the area of global health and nutrition, uh, and it's a NORHEAD, so it's, it's called the NORHEAD program, which I think Linda also knows well, and, um, and it basically supports um, uh, higher education and research in the areas of nutrition, uh, and um, and um, food systems and combating malnutrition. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a partnership between the University of Bergen, a center for global health, uh, and the University of Kinshasa, and also with the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa as a sort of South, South partner. And they had a first phase, which was from 2000 and Sticking to 2020, I believe, I'm sorry, I might have gotten the, and I do to work on this in NORAD, so I should remember, but they had a first five-year phase, which ended in 2019, I believe, and they had, and they have another phase, which was just confirmed for, uh, I believe, another five years, which is great news, because otherwise, to be honest, Norway does not have a lot of collaboration in the area of higher education um, and, and research, but this is one example. Uh, it's called GrowNut. Uh, and so um, I, I would encourage you to, to check out that project, which uh, should have um, uh, on the NORAD website, it should have a mention. Thank you. Excellent. And again, Anthony, thanks so much. And uh, <clears throat> there's also, um, there's another question from the audience here from Frode Eik. Um, and he is curious, he says, we tend to focus on gender and global health in resource poor settings, but many times low access to health can, to healthcare follow disadvantaged women regardless of the setting as after migration to higher income countries, even when the resources are available. And how may we see this in connection and link to human rights? So um, I was thinking maybe you, Jeanette, um, being the director for the center and most likely heard this question before. Would you like to comment on this? Thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to say thank you very much to the amazing uh, presenters and very interesting aspects that have come forth. And yes, uh, through the Ike is quite right. Uh, the disadvantage follows the women, that follows them from their community, their rural community to the city if they're in their home country or if they migrate across the borders or through war and disasters, they are forced migrations uh, to other places or like what we have seen now, the, <clears throat> the influx of migrants also to Europe and other places also in, in different kind of refugee camps. So women are always at the bottom of the totem pole and are at risk for in 
uh, adverse reactions, uh, in, uh, uh, violence, rape, as Nora mentioned, and also lack of access to appropriate uh, health care that they would need in the situation where they are most vulnerable, and that is during childbirth, as Anders so very interestingly presented what they're aiming at doing in Nigeria. So in Norway, in the European countries, the European Union took a, um, a stab at uh, uh, establishing a joint action project where actually 27 different countries in Europe are part of, where they are discussing just this issue, uh, Frode, where uh, what about the, the, the uh, vulnerability of the migrants and particularly the women migrants, and what is it that actually makes this a human rights uh, disaster as well as a minority access availability uh, challenge. And uh, that group is uh, called the uh, is uh, looking into different policies. There are some countries that have policies that actually is not providing the appropriate services uh, for the migrant population. It is also a lack of information, lack of knowledge, lack of trust, and uh, it's uh, a lot of lacks to say it the least. Norway is uh, leading this initiative. And I've, uh, we have the privilege from the center to be part of this. And um, hopefully uh, in 2022, we will come with an overview of some of the best practices in some countries so we can learn a little from each other to make sure that we jointly uh, secure women the best uh, uh, health services also in Western countries and how we can mitigate the challenges and obstacles that women migrating meets. Thank you, Jeanette. And also thank you to through the eight for the question which, which really reminded us how global the gender, uh, the, the aspects of gender and health actually are. Um, are there any other comments to that question? Anyone else who want to, to um, make a remark or a reflection on that? Um, if not, yes. Yes. Hi. Samira, I just please. Wanted, yeah. Yes. I just wanted to complete what Janet just said and say that um, sometimes, for example, uh, low access to healthcare uh, follow disadvantaged women after immigration in high income countries uh, because in her culture, previous culture, she doesn't use to seek care when, where she came from and when she needed. So sometimes she doesn't know that she has rights and in her new setting to have access and free access to healthcare system, to health um, care when she needed. So for example, for these uh, women, it may be interesting in these countries to have navigators in the healthcare sector that could guide these women and help these women seek care and navigate the health system when needed. Because otherwise she will try to, to cure herself, like her self-medication or just to, to deal with her pain or her need and never uh, seek for care because she may, if she may be afraid that she had to pay or she may not have uh, the, the care she needed. And she even know that it's a, a fundamental right in some high income country because in, in low income countries, it, you have to pay uh, yourself it's from your pockets. And if you don't have enough resources, you are afraid to go to her health care uh, facility to seek for, for care. Just wanted to add this. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Samira. It was very to the point. And uh, um, uh, I, I think now the time has come to try to wrap up a little bit. And I would suggest that um, 
I'll give the word uh, two minutes to each of the, the panelists to, to say some uh, closing remarks. Um, uh, so please do share your reflections um, and maybe also give the center some advices on how we should uh, go forward on, on working on gender and global health. So um, maybe I'll start with Marceline. Are you, are you ready, Marceline, to say some concluding words? Yes, thank you ever so much for having given me the floor. This seminar has been most useful for me because I've learned an awful lot listening to various panelists. And it's also helped me to think better and to do better. I would like to thank all the organizers because they have actually today uh, approached a very important uh, subject, maternal health. No, if there is no health, one can't do anything. One can't work, one can't develop one's community, one can't do anything uh, positive. So I thank you ever so much for having chosen this theme, this theme which has been very enriching for me. I think that we can now do something which will link Africa or, or link the rural uh, women, the rural women of Congo to all women in the rest of the world. We, could, we should really network all women throughout the world because we have to enrich one another with good ideas if we are uh, to improve a maternal health and health for all. Thank you ever so much. That's been most enriching for me. And I have been inspired by all the members of the panel who have taken the floor. They've been a, a real wealth of information for me. Thank you very much. Likewise, Marceline, uh, for being with us. So yeah, thanks a lot. That was a very inspiring last words from you for this time. And now, um, should we maybe give the word to Anthony as um, uh, representing uh, Congo, the embassy? Um, thank you so much. Um, and uh, I'm not sure I'm, I'm quite up to... Uh, up to the level of, of Marceline in terms of my um, my ex experiences, but I'm very honored to, to be given the word again. Thank you so much. Uh, and I think from, from, from the embassy, I think we'll just say that this, um, it's been a privilege to participate. And I think for us, uh, a reminder of the importance of focusing on women's access to health as a transversal uh, crossing theme in everything that we do. I think it's, it's completely essential uh, in order to, to support uh, the, the DRC. And it's a good mo moment because the, the president, Chisekedi, and, and his wife, uh, Denise, they're both promoting the agenda of hu uh, human universal health care as a big priority for them. So that is the good thing. Now, the challenge is, of course, making sure that their agenda actually reaches out and reaches rural women in poor areas that Marceline was talking about. I think that's a big challenge, but at least that political momentum is here and we can we can assist with supporting that agenda and helping to find ways of, of, um, of uh, implementing it. So thank you so much. Uh, and I look forward to continuing exchanges with, uh, with the other participants. Um, thank you. Thank you, Anthony, for your contribution and, uh, and uh, your inspiring words. So um, we'll move over to uh, Samira. Yes, thank you very much, Kari. Um, I would like to thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to contribute uh, to, contribute to this conference. And I would like to congratulate Marceline especially for her nomination uh, by the University of Oslo. I'm proud and I'm happy to see a Francophone woman working at community level um, as, achieve this and receive this recognition. 
So we need to remember that the patriarchal heritage that uh, heavily shaped most of the Francophone uh, Africa country doesn't help women uh, contribute to decision-making in global health and contribute to improve global health in general. So, uh, and I would like to, to, to speak about uh, the growing uh, Africa-led uh, philosophical movement of decolonizing science, aim, aiming to decolonize uh, people minds and promotes uh, an, an opportunity for departmentalizing science, especially in French speaking low income and middle income countries and in Africa, for example, because we, we, they, the movement want to promote abandoning uh, the usual and conservative path of science and intellectual production to move toward alternative approaches such as uh, humanistic, um, open-minded, equitable science where in French speaking women scientists can ha have more access to global health arena, have more visibility and share power and knowledge processes. So I would like us to remember this and support this and also to, to say that we, we, we need to work together to achieve uh, uh, to, to improve global health uh, everywhere. And we need allies, we need men to support this movement and we need to work all together. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Samira. And uh, I just uh, noticed that, um, or remember that uh, your, when I asked you about what women in global health are doing to increase underserved and underrepresented women's voices, and decision making in global health. The, the sound from you was a little bit poor. So I just saw that the, uh, your, your answer was uh, posted here in written. So if you don't mind, I just want to share that with all of us, just to make clear also the significance of women in global health as, as a platform. Um, because your answer goes like this, women in global health is working toward the implementation of um, uh, of country and regional chapters. And this allows tailoring needs to each context. And you, you continue, you heard Marceline, she knows her community best than anyone. Empowering her will help tailor interventions to her community needs. For example, in the 10 countries uh, that constitute the Francophone chapter, we are working to help women build confidence in themselves, develop their communication and leadership skills, and uh, we are also working to help them build a strong network in global health, which will help them access opportunities. And another strategy is the call on leaders from the region to commit in promoting gender equity and uh, including women in the governance and decision making. It is important for us to include men, as you just said, in our movement, uh, uh, because they hold more than 90% of the leadership roles in the health sector in the region. Uh, and we need them as allies. So just to underline uh, uh, some of your closing remarks, uh, you already touched upon this earlier on. So thanks a lot for your contribution, Samira. Very grateful for that. So uh, now we are, uh, we want to hear your concluding remarks, Anmash. Thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation. In fact, I think this has been compliment the organizers on the breadth and the and the scope of the different lines of thinking. Instead of focusing just on one or another direction that might be academically interesting and fit with the particular career backgrounds of the people who have been who are at the center, you really are demonstrating the academic, intellectual scopes of knowledge, breadth and complexity and multifaceted nature of the challenges that we all face in, in, in uh, empowering women, uh, also chipping in as best we can, those of us who are not women. Uh, and, um, 
And I think that's admirable, and uh, it promises well for the for the work of the uh, of the group going forward. So congratulations, and thanks very much for inviting me to be part of it. Thank you, Anders, for your encouraging and uh, and warm words. So, Anura, uh, now you can you have the opportunity to do have some closing <laughs> remarks. Yes. Well, thank thank you to you, Kari, and I'm extremely proud to be part of this uh, this this group of people who have been really showing the 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 impact and the importance of their work. I would like just to pick up a point that Samira made uh, on 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 availability of healthcare services because it's not only making them available; they really have to be attainable and accessible to all. And I've seen from my own work so many so many times how people who have, especially in the context of having been exposed to severe human rights violations of different kind, have problems attaining the kind of health care that they should, not only should from a humanistic point of view, but also from a human rights point of view, where they do, there is an obligation very clearly to provide uh, survivors of, of human rights violations with care and rehabilitation. So that's one point I want to make. And it really has to be accessible and attainable. And that's one of the reasons why we've tried to to develop something which does not uh, does not necessarily need need the full specialist services, but definitely uh, that will also be 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 and have to be uh, present. Another thing, having said that about the healthcare, I also want to underline the need to have a good strategy to prevent these violations from taking place. And and we were talking about migrants and women exposed to, for instance, sexual violence uh, during the migration situation, which again we know very often happens also to boys and men, but having a good strategy for really preventing this from happening in closed refugee camps, on the road, on people trying to, to, to come over the fences, to move it from one place to another, all these very, very vulnerable situations must be looked at. And there must be a very clear policy on prevent, prevention uh, of the violation and dealing with them when they occur. Thank you very much for this and uh, good luck with the work. Thank you so much, Nora. That was um, also very encouraging as the whole event actually, I would say have been. Uh, so thank you all for uh, contributing to, uh, to this event, which is also a celebration of um, the Center for Global Health making gender a cross-cutting topic. And with our, of course, our special uh, keynote speaker for today, Marceline Butza, who, who really um, made a very substantial uh, talk and uh, encouraging all of us to continue our work. And I hope to see you all again. Also the audience, thank you so much for participating. I think my um, colleague, Jeanette, would like to post a word also, but. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for me for now. And I hope to meet you all again on, on uh, different occasions. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear presenters and participants. Thank you for a very motivating webinar. The presentations of fantastic uh, projects and initiatives and your interesting thoughts and reflection. And a special thank you to Marceline for a new idiom for uh, gender in global health. You said, women are like lungs for the community and the family. And thank you to Professor Kari for skillful moderation. And thank you to Gabriela and Ingeborg for back office coordination and planning. And thank you to all for joining us this morning and have a blessed day and keep tabs on our uh, website and welcome back to another exciting webinar in global health.